Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Kratz. I am the Vice President for Education here at the National Building Museum, and welcome. Tonight's program is the sixth in a brand new series called For the Greener Good, Conversations That Will Change the World. The goal of this series is to bring together the nation's leading experts to discuss sustainability and the built environment. The programs will track how we've arrived at our present situation, the anticipated and unexpected effects of the green movement, and to offer considerations on a path to a more sustainable future. It is important that these, pro that these programs provide not only solutions, but also how you, the audience, can participate in creating a better future. And tonight, we're in for a real treat. Uh, tonight's program is entitled Abu Dhabi, City of the Future, question um, mark. This panel will examine the long-range 2030 plan for Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates. City planners are positioning this fast-growing city as a cultural crossroads between east and west, while at the same time following environmentally and culturally sensitive designs. And this is how current we are at the National Building Museum. Yesterday, um, ground was broken, I understand, for Mazdar, a planned carbon zero city that aims to be an incubator for sustainable technology and businesses. The program will engage with historic examples of other planned capitals, such as Brasilia in Brazil and Canberra in Australia, to see what lessons can be gleaned from this Arabian metropolis. We've assembled quite an impressive panel representing a wide range of thoughts and experiences. I look forward to an interesting discussion. And these discussions have been designed to incorporate your questions and thoughts. They are meant to be conversational in format. Um, we will break periodically during the program to take questions from the audience. And in an effort to get in as many questions as possible, I would ask that you be as brief as possible with your questions. At the end of the program, we invite you to continue the conversation with both the participants that are up here as well as uh, the person sitting next to you um, during a reception in the museum center court. The public reception is proudly hosted by the United Arab Emirates Embassy to the United States. If you like what you hear and experience this evening, we invite you to our next program in the series on March 18th, uh, which is entitled, Whose Carbon Is It Anyway? As the creation and maintenance of buildings creates over 40% of carbon dioxide that is released into the atmosphere every year, how do we curb this very real problem of CO2 accumulation? Who's going to take the lead for global change? The participants will include Scott Barrett, the director of the International Policy Bro Program uh, at Johns Hopkins University, Melissa Labinson, the Director of Federal Environmental Affairs and Corporate Responsibilities from PG&E Corporation, California State Assemblywoman Fran Pavli, and German architect Rainier Hoscher, co-founder of Hoscher Helle Architecture. The For the Greener Good series is presented by the museum's sustainability partner, the Home Depot Foundation, and we would like to thank them for their general support of this innovative lecture series. And before we begin, um, it, it's tremendously helpful for the, uh, the panelists that are up here to get a sense of who's out there in the audience um, and who they're speaking to. So can I ask you to raise your hands if you are architects? Great. Uh, planners? Wonderful. Uh, landscape architects? Great. Uh, engineers? Wonderful. Um, journalists? A few journalists. Um, students? Oh, that's great. Um, federal and state employees? That's great. And did I forget anybody? Artists? We're all artists, aren't we? <laughs> lawyers? I heard lawyers out there. I did. Well, that's great. Um, tonight, please join me in welcoming our moderator for this evening, who will in turn introduce our distinguished panel. Robert Ivey is an architect, writer, and editor. Since becoming editor-in-chief of Architectural Record, the magazine has grown to become the world's largest professional architectural publication, encompassing both print and the web. Under his leadership, Architectural Record received Publishing's highest honor in 2003, the National Magazine Award for General Excellence. A frequent sp spokesperson for the profession um, and here at the museum, we're very fortunate, um, he travels extensively from the magazine and has broadened its coverage to include more international projects. In 2003, um, Bob was, invite, was named Vice President and Editorial Director of McGraw-Hill Construction Publications. Please welcome Robert Ivey. Thank you, Scott, and good evening. Um, well, I get to play a, a, a comfortable role. Uh, I am no expert on Abu Dhabi. 
but it lets me ask hard questions and interesting ones and, and be a surrogate for you, but you'll also have an opportunity to ask questions yourself over the course of the evening. And the first question I would ask rhetorically is why are we gathered here at the National Building Museum discussing Abu Dhabi tonight? Uh, we could be elsewhere discussing other things. We could be discussing other places that uh, attract our attention today. Instead, we're dealing with the United Arab Emirates and a specific place on the Gulf. And here you can see the Arabian or the Persian Gulf and uh, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates located there, of which there are seven in this confederation. Uh, and Abu Dhabi is the capital of this uh, group of uh, Emirates. So we're about to gain some insight into this very specific place that is really sort of at the cornerstone of the world, uh, world's focus today. It's a small place geographically, but it is critical, uh, and it is making large plans for the future, and that obviously is why we are gathered here. Um, this former uh, center has, uh, since 1972, uh, in the unification of this uh, group of places into the United Arab Emirates, has grown in international prominence fueled by oil wealth, which has reached now, obviously, uh, tremendous heights. Uh, it earned a trillion and a half dollars from 2002 to 2006, which was double what it had earned in the past. And obviously, the price of oil has gone up since then. Um, the capital city, which is the seat of government, is si situated on the edge of a dune-filled desert, which is adjacent to the Gulf. And it filters out from this uh, dune sandy area out to a group of mangroves and ultimately to an archipelago uh, islands obviously into the Gulf itself. Um, the plans involve the recognition by this uh, sovereignty that petrodollars, rials, need to be become sustainable forms of currency in the future and that the region is growing in population and is ultimately changing. Nearby Saudi Arabia has one of the largest birth rates in the world. Uh, obviously, Dubai is booming. Everyone here has read about that place. Uh, you may know more about Dubai than you do about Abu Dhabi, but Abu Dhabi is laying great plans. Recently, they have announced, Abu Dhabi has announced the Mazdar Initiative. The word Mazdar means the source, which is a $15 billion investment. Now, take just a moment, catch your breath, and a $15 billion investment. And uh, it has various components. This investment involves such things as the Zayed Energy Prize, which will be an annual $2.2 million uh, donation gift to three individuals or organizations who have advanced sustainability. Uh, Included in this are targets for solar, wind, hydrogen power, carbon reduction, sustainable development, manufacturing, and research. It also involves the development of Mazdar City, which is a unique development that we'll be talking about and hearing further about tonight. Um, other Gulf entities have taken discrete paths toward developing these petrodollars to the future. Uh, for instance, Dubai has turned into a center of international finance and development, tourism, uh, high-tech, and commerce. Saudi Arabia has just planned, uh, just announced, the launch of six new cities, which are going to be industrial centers. This is not the path that Abu Dhabi has taken. Here, uh, you may be more familiar, if you're an architect, and I saw some hands up, with the new culture district that Abu Dhabi had already announced, which involved highly prominent architects from around the world who were going to be uh, building a variety of projects, including a new Louvre. But Abu Dhabi has taken a singular point of view, and that is to create the world's greenest city. So part of the Mazdar initiative is the creation of Mazdar City. Now this is a, uh, not Mazdar City, but the central business district of Abu Dhabi itself, which is part of a plan for the future of Abu Dhabi called 2030. And we'll be hearing more about that uh, through the course of this panel. Here you see the capital district itself. The center, uh, the, the city, Mazdar City, uh, actually will be a zero carbon, zero waste, car-free 
six square kilometer dis district with 1,500 businesses, 50,000 people, and we can see a rendering by Lord Norman Foster's office here for Mazdar City, which has really only recently been uh, announced. It will have no cars, it will have light rail. And it is one component of this larger master plan for Abu Dhabi itself for the year 2030, a plan that reimagines the whole of Abu Dhabi as a vibrant capital uh, in the desert in its unique location. So we're here to learn about this complex, uh, the plans for both the city of Abu Dhabi for the year 2030, for this carbon-free uh, city within a city, Mazdar City, which is part of this initiative, and to place it within the context of the region and world and urban planning. And to do that, we've got a one, the uh, National Building Museum has assembled a wonderful group of respondents, including from uh, this end down, Robert Fishman, who is the Emil Lorch Professor of Architecture and Urban Planning at the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. He is a, a highly honored and well-traveled, uh, well-known historian, and a historian with a specific bent, and that is uh, the history of cities, I think, and, and urban planning, urban studies. He's uh, known for the books that he's written, including Bourgeois Utopias, The Rise and Fall of Suburbia, and Urban Utopias in the 20th Century. And he has spoken here in the recent past. Uh, seated in the middle of the stage is Michael White, who is a senior, senior planning manager at the Urban Planning Council, who's responsible for planning the mainland area, including the new capital city for the UAE that you saw uh, depicted on the board, and for the development of the Plan Al Ain 2030, among his other projects. He came here after 10 years in the city of Vancouver, where he worked on other high-profile planning and corporate initiatives, including uh, Vancouver's uh, surge as uh, one of the leading uh, proponents of urban planning and most successful and densest uh, downtowns in uh, the continental uh, North America. He holds a Master of Science from the University of Toronto and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of British Columbia in Canada. And uh, also seated next to me, to my left, is Khalid Awad, who is the Director and Property Development of Property Development for Mazdar City um, at the Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, which is the company driving the Mazdar Initiative. He's currently overseeing the development in Abu Dhabi of the Mazdar Zone, which is this place that I've described to you. He's been involved in the construction industry in the Arabian Gulf for more than 22 years and has been himself a leader of companies. So we're interested in these individuals who are both on the inside and the outside. I'm fascinated by the breadth of knowledge we have here and the range of experience. Uh, to begin this evening's discussion, though, you need the context. I've shown you the window dressing from someone who has never been to Abu Dhabi. Uh, let's find out from people who've actually been there, who've worked on the grounds. And we'll begin with Michael. If you will give us uh, some overview of your work there, please. Thanks, Bob. We uh, thought it would be useful just to set the context for tonight's discussion before we head into the panel session. And uh, I'll just take a few minutes to describe the Plan 2030 that's been developed for Abu Dhabi. And within that, that sets the context for the, the Mazdar development, which uh, will be spoken about in a minute. Um, just to, to, I'm going to be zooming up from, from uh, different levels here, from at the ground to the higher level. Uh, what we're trying to develop in, in Abu Dhabi is uh, a, a different feelings on the ground right now. Um, what's happened is uh, the story of Plan 2030 goes something like this. Uh, about a year ago, there was a realization that there was uh, massive proposals uh, for large developments in the city, uh, 100,000 person communities in some cases, without any coordination, um, without any kind of measured approach to growth. And so it was seen by the leaders of uh, Abu Dhabi at the time that something had to be done um, to, to help coordinate that growth and to, to create a more sustainable future for Abu Dhabi. And uh, so what they did was they brought in uh, a, a team of uh, specialists from um, all over the world to, to sit with them over several months to develop a, a plan for the future of, uh, of Abu Dhabi. 
At the very ground level, what that, what that means is um, bringing uh, street uh, revitalization. There's a very uh, a difficult, discontinuous sidewalk network in the city. Um, there is um, uh, there's basically no transit in the city. So what the, the plan looks to do is create uh, more vibrant, mixed-use, um, complete communities in, in Abu Dhabi. I'll just have to, to, to switch the slides here if we can. Uh, so looking at introducing rapid transit um, in the city for the first time and have that at different levels, at the intercity level, at the metro level, and at the tram and, uh, and, and bus level. And uh, that's one of the biggest moves in, in terms of creating a more sustainable city in Abu Dhabi. There is actually pretty good density in the island of Abu Dhabi itself. Um, and to have that transit uh, available as another choice to the automobile will make a, a very big difference. Next slide, please. Um, we're, we're, we're bouncing around a bit here. We're, one of the big uh, themes of 2030 is to have um, a, a, a city galleries and an education process uh, to help the public understand, to help the professionals, uh, the development indu industry understra understand what uh, the plan means for the city and how they, how they can fit into the plan. Next, please. So in terms of uh, the sustainable framework, and this is one of the, the, the key drivers of, of the plan uh, 2030, is a more sustainable future uh, for the city. And this was something that was made very clear at the outset of, of, of creating the plan, of, uh, of the importance of uh, not only diversifying the economy um, for the future, uh, it's uh, mostly a, an oil-based economy now, but looking at creating a more diverse economy uh, down the road. Coupled with that is a, is, was a real uh, concern about a, a more sustainable future for the city. So there's uh, a number of concepts that were included in the plan about um, uh, green gradients in certain areas of development where more intense development in areas that were less sensitive, uh, virtually no development in areas such as mangroves, um, that were, were more sensitive uh, and more complete communities. So um, having uh, shops and services and transit within walking distance of, 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 of homes. Next slide, please. Uh, overall, the, uh, most of the, the development currently in Abu Dhabi is concentrated on the, uh, the western tip of the island of Abu Dhabi. And uh, one of the big con concerns was that we're looking at a, a tripling of the population through 2030. Um, is all of that development uh, going to be concentrated in the same area. And what was uh, concluded was that th there, there needs to be a balanced approach to, to the, uh, the, the intensity of development in the area. So uh, concentrating uh, in, in the central business district and around it, more growth, but also creating um, a, a counter to that and helping disperse some of that intensity with a new uh, capital city on the eastern edge of the city. And this will be um, a, a new city of about 350,000 people and uh, the, the, the seat of government for the entire country all connected through a transit network um, that will link up the different uh, elements of the city itself as well as up the coast uh, to Dubai. Next slide, please. So the central business district, this is a rendering showing that there would be that concentrated development with residential nearby so that people can um, be able to walk to work and, and uh, be able to take transit to work much more easily. Next slide. Uh, this is just a rendering of the, the, the capital city that's being developed. And one of our um, interests of coming to, to Washington now is to taking some of the learning from one of the great capital cities in the world as we uh, look to develop this plan. Next slide, please. And the, the transportation framework of having those different levels of service. This is one of the, the biggest moves that a city can make in terms of um, having that environmental impact. Next slide. And an open space framework. This is a view of the Corniche area in Abu Dhabi along the waterfront and actually having a plan put in place um, and, and linking up those, those open spaces. I don't want to take too much more time at this point, um, but just to let you know that this is a framework plan, which means it provides high-level principles and directions for the future of the city. It had to deal with some of those immediate issues of growth on the ground, which it did, but it also provides that high-level direction, which means that, um, that there's gonna, there is further planning that takes place down at the community level and at the neighborhood level, and Mazdar is an example of that. So it's more of a strategic approach to planning. It's not a comprehensive plan for those planners in the audience, that the official community plan that we see in many communities. Um, that's all done at once for very comprehensively for every area of the city. It provides that high-level direction and principles that allow further planning to take place, uh, which is where we're heading now. So with that, I'm, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it over. To Great. Thank you, Michael. So uh, now uh, you have the, the overview of the 2030 plan, and within that plan is Mazdar itself. And Khalid, would you please uh, tell us, just set the context for what that is? Thanks, Bob. Uh, 
Mazda City is a, a vision of a future model for sustainable cities. When we started talking about sustainable cities, we, we wanted to think of the uh, world movement into the green buildings and what was good, what was bad, and how can we really develop something that is uh, going to stand the test of time in an environment uh, like the one we have in Abu Dhabi. And we went into defining what a sustainable city uh, meant for Abu Dhabi. Sustainability in cities or sustainable cities would mean different things in different areas. For Abu Dhabi, a sustainable city is one that would stand, the, its urban planning would stand the test of time. It is well rooted into the history uh, of its uh, uh, urban planning. What were the lessons learned from the past of the Arabian cities? A city which would provide uh, high mobility for its residents and for people visiting it. Uh, a city that is flexible in terms of adapting to future technologies that will not be locked into technologies of today, so that will allow future technologies to phase in as they come. Most importantly, is a city that is going to also be valuable in terms of development. And not necessarily a beachfront city, but a city that can replicate what the success, uh, uh, successes of other cities in the world, like Manhattan or, or London, uh, specific areas in London or other cities, which have been successful because of one very simple fact, compactness. And the adequate level of compactness that is needed in cities to make it attractive and to optimize land value. So these factors have been taken into consideration, and we came out with the zero carbon, zero waste, and 100% uh, uh, powered by renewable energy city. Uh, the, the concept, as you see, is, is, a, is a square city to replicate the old model of the world cities. World cities, whether medieval cities or traditional Arabian cities, have been known to to have this uh, compactness and this uh, living, working environment, most importantly, without maybe doing it on purpose, they were very efficient in terms of minimizing energy dissipation. Uh, these cities have not been replicated because of the uh, lack of available technologies to be able to manage waste, wastewater in, in a very dense environment. With the available technologies of today, we could go back, look back at these old cities and uh, bring them back into a, a modern uh, look like the one that was suggested by uh, Foster and Partners. The zero carbon element was a, a way to get out from the greenwashing trend that is now going on. Uh, what is a green building? Is, is it something that, is it an object? that will just save energy, but could uh, produce more carbon to get the materials into the building that will save energy. So look at it. we wanted to look at it from a life cycle point of view, from a carbon life cycle, energy life cycle, water life cycle, from the time the material is supplied to the city to the time it is destroyed or recycled. And we looked at the zero carbon from three angles, materials, and we have now a process to select materials with low carbon and low embedded energy before we bring them to the city. Transportation, and we selected to have uh, no fossil fuel vehicles in the city. And energy, and all the city will be powered by renewable energy. And to do that, Abu Dhabi today is having a very low rate of power. And there is no direct justification to invest in energy efficiency measures because the power is cheap and it's not really worth it to, to invest in, in, in a big way in, in energy efficiency in buildings. So one thing, one opportunity we, th we, we saw is bringing up the power cost. And our power cost is the highest in the world, in the Masdar city. It is more than 25 US cents per kilowatt hour. And with that, it's unaffordable to, to use or to consume energy like you do in normal buildings in Abu Dhabi or around the world. So the most important aspect of the design was to bring energy demand 
down to unprecedented levels. And today we have achieved with the basic design that emerged from the master plan, energy efficiency levels that are more than 80% less than what a conventional building in Abu Dhabi would consume. Similarly, with water, more than 75% less than what uh, uh, the water uh, consumption is in, in uh, other buildings in Abu Dhabi. And uh, for the transportation system, first of all, we thought we wanted to differentiate between uh, different transportation planes. Whenever people are walking, they should not be stopped by vehicles. So we elevated the whole city on a podium. And on this podium, there are no vehicles at all. Under the podium, in the undercraft, there is a personal rapid transit system, which is a new, a new uh, horizontal elevator, if you like, that is automated with uh, more than 2,000 vehicles that will be able to move around the city in a grid system, taking people to different buildings and different places in, in very short times. And the light rail over the podium, elevated light rail that crosses the city diagonally and taking people to the airport or to other developments in the city. So that's a quick overview of what the city will look like. We, the, the main major uh, uh, or the main message was to create the highest quality of life with the lowest environmental footprint. And to achieve that, we used the one planet living principles uh, that were set by the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, and we, we used these principles and tried to exceed them. And these principles included zero carbon, zero waste, and all the other elements that I just mentioned. Thank Great. You. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Well, high goals indeed. And uh, we're going to be fascinated to see how these play out. Um, so for the next few minutes, we'll just uh, chat about the implications of the plans and the hopes. Uh, the amazing thing is that in this part of the world, so many of these really visionary schemes are being executed. Um, for Robert Fishman, I would begin with you and ask, you're a student of the evolution of the city and of the <clears throat> planned city. Um, and we're sitting right here in the nexus of yeah. one such place. Uh, it would be inappropriate not to mention that we, okay. we, such things do happen uh, from the abstract to the real. Uh, think back, if you will, with us as a group and uh, other places that have planned, had major dreams, and where human will has uh, been imposed on a landscape to achieve some specific end, in this case, a capital, uh, and then this lofty goal of uh, energy usage. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, what, what do you okay. derive from yeah. your, your own knowledge of the past? Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm always very excited by these uh, audacious plans. Among other things, uh, it gives me much more to write about. <laughs> and first of all, as you say, the, the great capital plan is and always will be the city we're sitting in. And I think uh, there's some very important lessons that uh, are inherent in, in the L'Enfant plan. Uh, L'Enfant understood that a capital had to have grandeur. Yes, I mean, we, we recoil from that today, but yes, it does. Uh, but it also had to have the, uh, the human scale for the ordinary life that would be lived in it. And he gave these two goals, uh, you know, a really perfect design uh, orientation through uh, the great network of diagonals that defines the grandeur and the, and the, the grid that defines the ordinary life. And these two together comprise Washington. Uh, and this is the, I mean, this is the key to operate simultaneously at these two different levels. Because we can, or, it's, it's, not, it's never all that hard to do the ordinary commercial city. Grandeur, I mean, size you can do. I mean, look at uh, Ceausescu's Bucharest. That is big and that is horrible. Size is not grandeur. And similarly, small is not human scaled. To somehow bring those two together, I think, is the great, uh, cha is the great challenge here. 
One of the things that's working, I think, in favor of Abu Dhabi and the, the 2030 plan right now is that we rediscovered the human scale, the pedestrian scale density as a value. To me, the great uh, mistake of places like of the modernist capitals like Brasilia and Chandigarh was that because the modernist ethos was to open up the city, to create these great spaces even in the residential areas, you didn't have the contrast that you needed between the open space of the spaces of grandeur and the uh, enclosure of where ordinary people live. I think one of the great uh, uh, steps forward, really, uh, that we see in the 2030 plan was just that attention to the small scale, uh, which, you know, uh, we'll perhaps talk about that more. It's, you know, it, it's that possibility that really intrigues me. And just one more lesson from uh, the L'Enfant plan that I'd like to bring up, and that somehow uh, the geometry of it required L'Enfant's wonderful insight into the topography of the Washington area. Uh, just putting the capital where it is, the one right place for it, that sense of topography. And, you know, that gives life to the geometry. And I don't know Abu Dhabi either. I mean, I've seen, I saw these images. There are a lot, there's lots of geometry. The question is, does it really respond to the topography? Does it live in that sense? I mean, that's the, that's the issue, I think, that, uh, you know, that marks the difference between things that look wonderful on a PowerPoint and things that will really live on the ground. There's been a, a, a bit of a debate in the United States uh, recently between, uh, let's call them the uh, adherents of Jane Jacobs and those of Robert Moses in New York, the city that I live in, which has to do with grand vision and the ability to execute versus, if you will, uh, the organic, uh, finely textured urban character that uh, we have lionized for these last uh, decades and a reappraisal of the legacy of both and, uh, you know, not necessarily in an either-or situation. But in following that up, much of what we admire today in the contemporary city and have been taught to admire has to do with the organic nature with, of the way that cities arise. Uh, the small scale, as you mentioned, uh, the happenstance commercial shop, the uh, the, uh, the individual uh, act of will, the uh, human mark within this larger framework. Um, how successful are these larger places at achieving this balance between the abstract idea and real placemaking? Yeah, well, I, as you suggest, I mean, the, the history of the modernist era has not been a happy one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just want to put one idea forward that, uh, you know, I, 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 I yield to no one in my admiration for Jane Jacobs and for that organic vision. Uh, but she lived in a time when essentially New York was made. You didn't have to remake it. You didn't have to remake the world. You had to really learn to live within it. And I think what's, uh, especially with the Mostar, idea that we're going to have to remake the world. We're going to have to have a different, you know, just a different way of building. And where that authority is going to come from to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as I say, I, I yield to no one in my retrospective hatred of Robert Moses uh, either. But I see a need to rebuild the authority of planning. Uh, that these ideas, you know, however remote they are from uh, these visions, however remote they are from us geographically, nevertheless speak to something I think important even for us. Okay. Uh, Michael, uh, in following this up, uh, relationships, if you will, uh, you have been involved in this large scale plan for uh, the Capital District in particular and uh, this 2030 plan which envisions this place growing out over time. Mm -hmm. 
And can you tell us uh, something about the relationship of the vision for the whole of Abu Dhabi and for the specific of Mazdar City, how the goals, for instance, of uh, transit and sustainability, both were expressed in Mazdar City. How are they different in the 2030 plan? How does the whole envision itself? I think Part of that answer is the, the learning that can take place. Um, I think some of the, the great failures of planning have been when it's an end state plan for uh, an entire city and it's, uh, it's completed up front and there's that expectation that that's it. Uh, through uh, a more strategic approach like we have with 2030, it sets that broad, the broad policies and directions, but it allows for the creativity and the innovation to happen at that local level. Um, so it's a matter of putting the right ingredients in place to allow that. And um, it's, I would like to think that most of the neighborhoods can, can take on the, the Mazdar principles and a lot of the, the mechanisms that are being put in place. But the reality is that can't all happen at once, um, that it needs to be piloted and tested, and Mazdar is doing that, and um, allow that learning to, to, um, to, to use that in the other neighborhoods that will be developing over time, because that's what we want to see is um, phased, measured growth over time. So it's the learning that we want to focus on. And to set things uh, in, a, in a chronological context, the planning for 2030 began, and then the planning for Mazdar began somewhat subsequent to that. Is that correct? Yeah, I think there is some lag. The, the, the planning for Abu Dhabi 2030 started before Mazdar. Are they informing each other? How, how is that playing out? Well, we found out about each other in Abu Dhabi because we were working oh. under the same umbrella. <laughs> okay. But we communicated as soon as we knew that this is happening. Uh -huh. On the 2030, we communicated the master ideas and we got the blessing that this is exactly what this plan is driving the whole Abu Dhabi for. So go ahead and continue your planning because this is a catalyst for the 2030 plan. Mm -hmm. plan. This is how a master has been looked at by the 2030 plan. But commenting on, on the pr previous discussion whether uh, we have to re-engineer the world uh, we have to realize today that for the first time in history, 50% of the world population uh, is living in cities. And that's a, it's a major change. It's a, it's a big message that urban developments of the future or cities of the future must be different. If you bring in the carbon element to this and the energy demand element to this, we have to stop thinking that people can continue living the way they want to live and they need to, to just uh, uh, implement or drive cities the way they like to live or try with them. Now they have to be responsible about how they live. And this is, for the first time, something that people should adapt to a new parameter, which is um, CO2 emission, em energy demand, and the, the huge growth uh, of the population in urban cities. The uh, imperative that Mazdar City be carbon neutral, which is a, a high uh, and a lofty goal. Um, you mentioned and touched on a bit on how this will be achieved, but obviously building a carbon neutral city in a desert climate uh, adjacent to the Gulf will be a difficult thing to achieve. Uh, where will the basic elements come from? For instance, water. How is that going to be dealt with for this place? Let's just take that one thing. Yeah. I mean, because of the, uh, uh, what Michael was describing, most of the developments are happening in the area around Mastar. That is causing a, a potential uh, elevation in the water table. Mm -hmm. For us, it's an opportunity, because now we can take the, the water table, or the water, in the, in the, which is very shallow water mm -hmm. table in Mastar, and the area around it, and, and desalinate that water. And so we don't need to bring water from the sea to do that so that we can e balance, actually, what's happening with the other developments. Mm -hmm. uh, we are calling for the other developments to send us their wastewater. Hmm. And we would welcome any wastewater that come to Mazdar City. And if you see the city uh, planning, 40% uh, of, the, of the area is dedicated to the, to the uh, development itself. And 60% is uh, left for uh, land around it that could be used for green, the green strategy and for future technologies to come in and, and help in the water and wastewater schemes. 
would, would you clarify for us a bit, uh, because I'm not fully uh, comfortable in, un in my understanding, about the relationship between this Mazdar initiative, which is this enormous investment, which includes, I would assume, uh, technological exploration and innovation into some of the systems that you would then <coughs> employ in the city itself. Is that a fair assessment of the yeah. way that will work? Two years ago, the Abu Dhabi government decided to launch uh, the Master Initiative, which is a new economic development program to diversify Abu Dhabi's economy and to assist Abu Dhabi in enhancing its market share in the global energy market. Today, Abu Dhabi is the fifth uh, largest oil exporter, and uh, the global energy market is evolving at a rapid pace for Abu Dhabi to be able to maintain its market share in the global energy market it must develop new forms of energy, sustainable forms of energy, mm -hmm. so it could keep its market share uh, in the future. And when we look at oil, we, we take the analogy that uh, uh, with, with the Stone Age, we're not out of the Stone Age because we're running out of stones, and I think this applies to oil as well. Oil is going to be there for the next many decades for critical uses like petrochemicals or export to places that are growing uh, at a high rate, like, like uh, Asian countries. But using oil in buildings or in developments is, is possibly going to become a waste of this resource. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the initiative is having different components, uh, an education and research and development component. We're establishing uh, with MIT uh, the first graduate level education and research institute focused on advanced energy and sustainability in the region. It's master's and PhD in science and engineering. And we have already started funding more than 20 different research tracks with MIT and with different universities around the world to develop research projects in, in the advanced energy space. At the same time, we have a clean, tech, uh, clean technology fund of $250 million that's investing in clean technology companies. And uh, this fund has been for the most invested in US companies. Uh, we have also a, a commissioned a large uh, feasibility on carbon capture and storage uh, in Abu Dhabi. We, are, uh, we have just finished the uh, pre-feasibility of a hydrogen power plant and we're working with BP for, uh, to start the front-end uh, engineering design of a 500 megawatt hydrogen plant. We are working to develop a large-scale manufacturing <coughs> of uh, photovoltaics in Abu Dhabi. <coughs> and one of the components of the master initiative is the development of Master City. Uh, $15 billion that was uh, announced a few weeks ago by the Abu Dhabi government behind Mazdar Initiative is, is uh, dedicated to this project. The Mazdar City development is uh, going to cost $22 billion. That's separate from the 15. Only a small part of the 15 billion is going to uh, help develop the infrastructure of the uh, Mazdar City. Mm -hmm. um, Regarding this carbon neutral concept, because uh, it's, a, it's a term that's bandied about a great deal within uh, the popular press and within our own uh, sustainability uh, community and, and in writing. And, and it's obviously a goal, but it's something that uh, is difficult to achieve at best. And yet it is, it is a, a goal, a, a discrete goal of this place. From Master, for Master City. For Master City. Well, it's definitely a, a target for Master City. That's mm -hmm. the, the whole vision is, is based around this mm -hmm. goal. Uh, it's not a moving target. It's something that we know how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. We had to define boundaries, and we're still uh, fine-tuning these boundaries of what a, a zero carbon mm -hmm. uh, means and how can we get off the ground with construction by being as carbon neutral as possible from day one, which is a very difficult task to do. That's why we're quantifying some of the carbon we're, we're uh, uh, producing now. And already we started offsetting it by, by building a, s a small PV plant that is sending power to the grid before we started even construction. But carbon neutral during construction, so we're offsetting everything that will emit during construction, and zero carbon in operation is a definite target for the city. Obviously, this will garner a tremendous amount of scrutiny. There's, there's a certain amount of uh, skepticism about a truly carbon neutral, certainly development at that scale. I would think that the world will be looking at you very carefully. And uh, I'm interested in uh, Abu Dhabi's goals uh, for itself and for Mazdar City uh, receiving the world's attention, because you're building a place 
that other people are going to want to look at, and in the case of a carbon neutral place, emulate, I would assume, if it achieves the level of success. What about this, the, the history of places that have set themselves off as examples, uh, cities to be like, utopian places? Yeah. Robert, what, what, what's been the history of such places in the past? Yeah, well, as far as their, uh, as far as their proponents are, are concerned, they're often, uh, and their critics of course, they're often seen as failures, and yet they become the models for, you know, for the next century. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite examples is that of uh, Ebenezer Howard, the obscure English stenographer who founded the Garden City Movement, because he believed that everyone had the right to live in a place that was healthy, that had space and air, that had uh, planning, and of course, you know, he actually founded uh, garden cities in, in, in England. Uh, he was ridiculed, reviled, and so on. And yet, this garden city idea uh, has spread around the whole world. It has become the standard uh, aspiration uh, in, so, in so many parts of the world. So that, uh, in many ways, there's nothing more practical that you can do than to be utopian in this way. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we intended to do now, because you've heard a bit, we're going to uh, have an opportunity to ask questions from the audience, because obviously we've thrown a great deal of information. Then we'll go back and ask the panel some more discussion, and then we'll have final questions. Uh, I see a hand up early here. <laughs> Hi there, thank you very much for coming, because I think this is a really important subject. Um, and I think it's very commendable that uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, Mazda are, are interested in creating a zero carbon city. I'm just a little curious where uh, the food comes from for the people who will live there, uh, if it's created or if it's grown on site, uh, and if not, if the um, carbon footprint of the travel of the food has been taken into consideration uh, for the people who will be living there. Thanks. Well, the basic strategy for Mazda City is not to come to that level of detail. What you would like to do is see the uh, uh, retail uh, industry take care of that by showing us how they are offsetting any carbon they are producing. So let's say if we go to Sainsbury and Sainsbury comes and locates in Mazda, Sainsbury will have to show Mazda <coughs> City that this is the, the traceability they have on their carbon, and if they say we're bringing high carbon food, then the total carbon that they will, they will bring, they will import into the city, should be offset somehow, either jointly with the city through our offset strategy, or directly with their offset strategy if they're doing something automatically. And I think you see this movement going into different types of industries, not only food. We will not tell them what to do, and we will not get into the food business, but we will ask them to show us what's their carbon offset strategy, how they're dealing with this fact. The second part of, of, of this important question is that we don't want to change people's behaviors. People can do whatever they want. And I gave this example in the morning in one of the meetings. I mean, if you want to stand in the shower and keep the water open for 25 minutes, you can still do that. We'll just put a sensor <laughs> that will stop the water after three minutes, and if you want to continue use the water, you can still do that, but you're just feeling that you're doing it. You're just aware that you're doing it. I think the awareness issue is most, more important from, from our carbon strategy more than how to do it exactly. Another question. Yes. Thank you very much. With the 350,000 people anticipated, who are they? We've talked about everything but the people who may or may not be there. Are they just office workers? Are they residential? Um, you mentioned two cities before, New York and Washington, D.C. New York has a very vivid personality of its own. Certainly financial is easy to say. Publishing is easy to say. D.C. has the capital of political. What do you anticipate for these this city and the people who may come to live there. I'll answer, I'll answer that. Um, the, right now, the breakdown for the Emirate is about 20% or so uh, local Emiratis, the population 80% or so uh, 
expats from various countries from around the world. These cities that were developing, uh, planning and developing, and actually the, the population of Abu Dhabi were, were anticipating to, to triple to around 3 million. It was 350,000 just for the new capital city. But in all cases, we want to make these mixed use, complete communities for everybody. So when we talk about housing, we want to have a range of housing and a range of housing choices. Uh, when we talk about transportation, we want to talk about transportation choices for, for, for the entire population. Um, it's the same with the, 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 the central business district in that new capital city. We want it to be mixed use. We want it to have residential uh, right, in the, right near the offices so people be able to walk to work. Um, so it's kind of that complete community, mixed use, um, providing a range of, of, of housing and services and transportation uh, for everybody that lives there. Here. When they supposed to allow, allow the presentation, I had difficulty finding a place to park. So I'm trying to find out, is there a way to see this on the internet or something like that if you miss it? Or is it not? The, the plan, plan 2030 is available on the internet and we can uh, provide you with the, uh, the website. For, Thank you. For the, yes. Question back here. Thank you. My name is uh, Mary Arabaga, wearing two hats today, one for the Voice of America, and the second one as a uh, future architectural student and interior <laughs> designer. Um, my first question is two parts. You said that uh, the population would probably be about 80% expats. What I want to know is that with these mixed housing and enclaves, in other Arab cities, there is this contention between the different cultures. You can drink in some parts, you, can drink, you cannot use alcohol and uh, other types of behavior in other parts. How have you addressed that? That's my first question. The second question is, this uh, Emerald City that you're building um, seems absolutely wonderful. However, is it possible to ex extrapolate backwards this kind of plan for countries, for developing countries that don't have as many petrodollars? So, for example, if I were building, if I wanted to build a new city on a coastal place in Africa, is there a way that this kind of plan can be used for a future city in a developing country that doesn't have as many petrodollars as you do in Abu Dhabi? Thank you. I guess I can answer the, the first question. Um, one of the big themes in, in Plan 2030 is, is diversity. And um, I know moving there, I had some... Uh, preconceived thoughts about what living in Abu Dhabi would be like. And uh, it's, it's uh, contrary to a lot of beliefs um, in North America. It's not a, a, a walled city with, uh, full of compounds and a real segregation. It is very much a, a mixed city now, and that's a, a theme that we've built on with Plan 2030. So when we talk about um, housing choices, we do mean that, that there's choices in the, in the new cities and communities we're planning that will have a range. And it's also about housing types, too. Right now, there's there's apartments and there's villas, and those are the, basically the only two types of housing uh, available in Abu Dhabi. And what we want to do is in, increase that range of housing for everything in between as well, because those meet different uh, parts of, of, of the market. So um, diversity is a big part of, uh, of the plan. Yeah, I'll address the second question. Masdar City is not, uh, the, the, uh, the, the purpose of building the city is, is exactly what you just said, is to be able to replicate and transfer some of the solutions, partially or fully, into other cities, whether they are in China or Africa or the United States. What we are presenting here is a model. It's not the cost of the building itself. I mean, you can build any building. If you are basic, uh, you're, uh, assuming that the power for the building is coming from renewable energy, you need to bring energy demand down to be able to afford renewable energy. If you can have in Africa a, a city that is independent from oil, then the way to do it is to use renewable energy and to drive energy efficiency to the low levels. To afford these technologies, you can do that by reducing your energy demand. So I think what we are presenting is a model rather than just how much is the cost of the construction itself that could differ from one country to the other. And different models like transportation models and other models will show that they pay back in time very shortly. Most importantly, the land value, if you look at where is the highest land value in the world, is in places where you have compactness, the adequate density. I'm not talking to the 
Hong Kong types of density, but to the density like Manhattan, London, Venice. This is where land has the highest value. So if, from a development point of view, if you look at it from, for any developer over 15, 20 years, the land value can be maximized by a master city model. And this, is, this has been proven historically with every city that has gone to that level of compactness. Uh, we might uh, take a few more questions in a moment, but follow up on a couple of these that were raised in part by what was just uh, mentioned. And uh, one, again, brings me back to Washington, the place that we're sitting, and thinking about the United States and the lessons that we might take from this uh, experiment that we're uh, engaged in talking about tonight. And that is that uh, the United States is witnessing uh, this massive buildup in, uh, in Abu Dhabi and in other places as well. And um, the question of the lessons that we'll be able to take here in this country, you've, you've touched on, but, but are there lessons other than, let's say, urban compactness? What we're witnessing here uh, with Abu Dhabi, it seems to me, is an, an extraordinary act of will on the part of a, of a sovereign place uh, to uh, effect something new. And there's an enormous investment of capital uh, in a single place over a 15-year over a, a year period, let's say, roughly, uh, to achieve this end. Are there analogies here in the United States that any of you, are, or in North America, that uh, any of you are, that make sense for us? Yes, <laughs> I mean, of course, we sh you know, looking beyond our present paralysis or looking, looking back, I mean, remember, this is the society that settled the continent essentially in a, in a century that flung an incredible network of new cities across that continent that built uh, a transportation system on a continental scale that astonished the world. Uh, this, you know, this is the society we're sitting in right now. Uh, so, to me, it's simply, it's obvious that uh, a democratic society has the wherewithal uh, to, to respond to, to, to these crises. I mean, we've shown it, we've shown it in the past. And I think that uh, one of the, one of the uh, fruitful elements, say, of Mostar is, you know, you've made a start. Now we need a hundred Mostars, a thousand Mostars in our American cities. It's as simple as that. Uh, another question that was raised was the question of diversity. Yeah. And uh, in the American press, there has been a significant amount, I would say, of uh, criticism of, of uh, workers who have, particularly, I think, because we know about Dubai, uh, who have had uh, inferior housing situations in the building up of a place like Dubai. Is Abu Dhabi doing anything to address that question, which seems to be very much on the mind of certainly the citizens of the United States? Well, in terms of uh, 2030, I described it as the, the principles and directions for, for future growth and development in Abu Dhabi. And uh, one of those principles is uh, complete communities and services for, for the entire population. So that idea that there is housing available, that you do have shops and services, uh, transportation available, that principle applies to everybody. So it's, uh, it's something that's across the board and something that 2030 broad, broadly ref reflects. I mean, for Master, yes. uh, one of the principles of uh, the one planet living that we have adopted is social equity. And that addresses exactly what you just mentioned. Uh, our uh, workers' housing will, uh, will be powered by photovoltaics for its, most of its power. That tells you that this is going to follow the whole city strategy. I think the uh, one is to make sure that the city is going to be credible, because that was the first thing that we thought of when we, when we thought about the workers' accommodation, but also to make sure that uh, even our workers are aware of the importance of, of having the zero carbon uh, in their daily practices, in their, in their uh, construction work as well. 
And we, we aim to turn out the workers' housing in the future to become a research hub or a technologist training center. Because today there is no facility management company that is addressing the management and maintenance of uh, solar thermal plants or photovoltaics at a scale like this. So we have an issue with training people. Mm -hmm. And I think we can use the workers' housing as, as a kind of community college, if you like, for, for training these types of uh, skills. OK. Uh, all of this planning and this massive planning and the images that we've seen thus far have been accomplished in, well, everything seems to move very quickly these days, uh, but in, in a very short period of time in relative terms. Uh, can you talk about the role of planning and uh, how it is being executed in Abu Dhabi? And uh, because I think many of us here, we saw many hands of professionals, architects, engineers, planners uh, were raised in the course of this evening. And how speed uh, is able to accomplish uh, such large scale and visionary views of the future for a place. Uh, and does that differ from other places that you've worked? Or is it just our perception that this is being done on a very rapidly unfolding timetable? Well, I think it's important to, to recognize that Plan 2030 isn't the traditional comprehensive official community plan, which they do take uh, quite a bit of time because it's uncovering every rock and going into that much detail uh, for every aspect in every neighborhood and every location in the city. Again, this was a strategic approach because it, we have to deal with um, those pending development questions when you're talking about a 100,000 person community that's um, being developed without being coordinated with the other 100,000 person community next door. We need to respond to that uh, very quickly. So it was, it's matching the tools to the issues or, or to the situation. In this case, using a, a strategic or framework plan was the right tool to be able to provide those questions, dealing with those immediate questions of development, but also providing the broad and the vision for how development should take place and where it should take place um, in the future. Okay, I think we can take some more questions from the audience here now. There's some at the back. Scott, if you... Thank you. Uh, my question is concerning the, uh, the carbon offset. Um, it, on one extreme, of course, you could be sequestering a lot of carbon on site. At the other extreme, you could be um, emitting a lot of carbon and buying carbon uh, credits on the, uh, in the, in the carbon credit market. And of course, all of this would still lead to carbon neutral. Could you go a bit in detail on what is the strategy in uh, Abu Dhabi? Thank you. Yeah, for the development of Master City, we are not taking into consideration any financial offset. Uh, however, we have two major offset strategies. One is through our green strategy in the city and through the tree nursery that we're going to have. And that will be manufacturing trees, if you like, and sending them outside, and that will offset uh, carbon. And also, in the future, as energy efficiency becomes, comes in uh, more than what we have expected or we have planned for, the city will be having excess energy that will be sent back to the grid. So energy is going to be another way to offset carbon. Now, on the material side, if once we buy cement or concrete, for example, it has carbon in it, we'll have to ask the suppliers to offset this carbon financially if we cannot do it through the city, either by taking this part, which is 1% or 2% of the maximum 2% of the cost of the material in some cases, uh, deducting it from the cost of the, of the material and putting it in a fund and developing offset strategies in Abu Dhabi locally, so not buying something in, in Africa or in, in Asia in, in forestry or, or something like that, no, but just developing similar projects in Abu Dhabi, either in the city itself or outside the city. Uh, that's, that, that is related to the material side, which, which we might not be able to offset completely inside the boundaries of the city. But on the energy and transportation side, it's directly offset through the strategy. Another question? Uh, there. Thank you very much for coming. Um, bring it down to the ground level for one quick question. Um, the elimination of cars or the reduction of cars is a wonderful objective, 
Um, but if you, Mr. Awad has lived in Abu Dhabi for a long time, I hope Mr. White will have the opportunity of walking around in July or August. Um, <laughs> the temperature, the situation the way it is, is it really practical or appropriate to be eliminating the, I mean, people live in their cars because if you go from one door to the, across the street, you're so soaking in sweat for six months of the year. So how, I mean, maybe you better, better build a bubble over the top of the whole city would be more <laughs> practical in terms of, of uh, transportation. So how are, you, how are you addressing that issue, please? One prime consideration in the design of the city and the orientation of the square was this particular aspect of how can we change the microclimate of the streets. First of all, we got narrow streets, so the old traditional streets, very narrow, shaded to the most part. Uh, and we wanted to achieve a real feel which is a technical term for what the body would feel about temperature of at least 20 degrees less than what somebody would feel on the Abu Dhabi streets. And we have achieved that through our simulation and modeling. The microclimate in the city, on the humidity, on the temperature level, is going to provide this real feel of minus 20, if not more, in, in summer. Uh, in addition to that, we thought that people should be very close, and this is what I mentioned by mobility, to the points of uh, transportation. So the maximum distance that anybody should, would be able to move to get to a PRT system is 150 meters. So 150 meters with the real feel that I just mentioned would be something that people could uh, live with. Another question? Let's try someone else back here. Thank you. Uh, your power requirements, you're going to use renewable energy? Is it then Dubai, or is it your place that they're going to do a nuclear power plant? Well, I'm, I don't think that we have, uh, UAE has announced that they'll do a nuclear power plant. France will, hasn't signed up to do a nuclear power plant? They there? haven't signed. They just mentioned publicly that there is a nuclear cooperation. This is part outside the Mustard Initiative, but there is a lot of uh, uh, hype about what actual discussion on the nuclear program. The Gulf countries have decided to pursue uh, a nuclear uh, strategy for power, but this hasn't really uh, uh, translated into clear projects. This is beyond our, our initiative, but because many people asked us about what, what are you doing in terms of nuclear, there was only the, the visit of Mr. Sarkozy to Abu Dhabi, which was mentioned, uh, the nuclear issue was mentioned as a strategic cooperation, but nothing has been signed. It's Libya. Yeah, Libya has signed a <laughs> nuclear program. Uh, here's a question for you while they're formulating some more themselves. I'd love to get a, a, just a verbal uh, description, if you would, of what you think Abu Dhabi is going to be like culturally. Uh, we know that there is this immense mosque that is already a component of uh, city life there, and uh, that there will one of the islands is being transformed into a cultural precinct. Um, culturally, what sort of place is this going to be in, in your vision for the future? What, what will Abu Dhabi be like culturally? I think that's a really good question. It's a, it's a challenging one, considering you have 80% of the population from other places. So it's something that needs careful consideration when, when you're doing a plan like this. Seti Ed Island, which you're, you're referencing, is mm -hmm. um, going to be home to um, some major cultural institutions from around the world like the Louvre and the Guggenheim, um, educational institutions like NYU, um, trying to create that hub and that focus to bring that um, to Abu Dhabi, which is more of that international flavor, at the same time trying to um, celebrate uh, the Emirati culture. And that's not just in the activities and celebrations, but actually in the design of, of the different neighborhoods and buildings. And that's something in our in the planning of the new capital city that we, we're, we're having to address is that how can this place express the people of Abu Dhabi, the culture of Abu Dhabi, the identity of Abu Dhabi. Um, there's also interest in recognizing other great cultures in the world and other great cities in the world. So looking at the design of the capital city, how can we try to do both of those things? Mm -hmm. And also an expression of the landscape and where this place is located because bringing in uh, generic or ideas from other places and just dropping it in here, I think will be a failure. So it's bringing in the kind of concepts or ideas and then adapting them to the place because it is a 
desert environment. It is near 50 degrees Celsius in the summer. It's got some very distinct characteristics, so it's tailoring it to that. Mm -hmm. Robert, have other places been successful at bringing forth their own spirit and their own sort of uh, sense of self through grand schemes, or do grand schemes call for the yeah, abstract? Well, yeah, well, again, I mean, look at this country. Yeah. That is, look at what Chicago was okay. uh, in, in 1890, uh, the most diverse collection of people in the whole world. Uh, and again, uh, from European, you know, in terms of European high culture, uh, without a culture of its, of its own, so what do they do? They bring in the opera house. They create the greatest symphony orchestra in the world. Uh, they, they build one of the great art museums in the world. But they also, uh, at the same time, are creating their indigenous uh, Chicago culture, Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of precedent for it. Uh, you know, the issue is, will it, will it happen? Mm -hmm. And I think one, you know, one aspect of this is that if you, you know, contrast Chicago, you know, there was you know, a sense that Chicago was somehow continuing Western civilization. And I don't, you know, Abu Dhabi, I think, is trying to do something different. And in design terms, for example, you know, in these cities of the past, there was the Western sector and the traditional sector. And I have the sense that you're trying to do something different there, too. Uh, well, you know, in other words, I don't know, you know, in other words, how do you, you know, I mean, that's, that's the, you know, that's the issue. We know there's a global culture forming out there, but is this global culture anything more than the United States magnified? And, yes, and that is the rhetorical question, and yeah. it, as they say, remains to be seen, because uh, it, what we see, I think, uh, portrayed it is a global city, something with great ambition that uh, aims to set itself apart on the global stage and, and attract world attention and uh, world visitation. And uh, so that, that component remains for time to play out. Other questions from the floor? Here's one right in the front row. Yes, um, I wonder if you have thought, or if it's any relevance, what the lessons from this model would do to our old cities? Is there any way to use the lessons learned from here to retrofit our old cities and make them maybe not as perfect as this, but better than what they are now. Yeah, I think the integration of waste, transportation, power, water into a city management in the way we are doing is, is the most important lesson. The Mostly when, when cities fail because of the lack of integration of these different services. But I think if we, can, if we can achieve the level of integration that we're aspiring uh, in the city uh, planning for Mustar, I think that will be the biggest lesson learned. The second part is whether it's a retrofit or new design, integrated design planning, something that we bring the facility management company early on in the process, the contractor early on in the design thinking. And even if you're retrofitting a building, bringing the end user from the beginning, not just the architect with the prima donna uh, vision, what, what's going to happen with the building, how it's going to be used, bringing this element early in the process is again something I think could be uh, driven from Mustard. In addition to that is the technological breakthrough, ener energy efficiency and, and could be applicable to retrofits and, and, and new construction similarly. Actually, I'd like to reverse that question if we can, not to put you on the spot, but Michael, this morning we spent about two or three hours touring Washington, D.C. with representatives from the National Capital Planning Commission. Did you take any lessons out of touring D.C. that you're then going to take back to you to Abu Dhabi that will help inform your process? Uh, absolutely. I think um, as we're planning the, the new capital, one of the big questions is how do you manage and govern the, the, the federal sites and monuments and, and the activities in a, in, a, in a real city, within the setting of a real city. So it was uh, very informative to hear about some of the, uh, 
the, the things that work um, with the, the different bodies here in Washington and some of the things that are, that are challenging, especially those cross-jurisdictional uh, planning issues where you want to be integrating, uh, say, um, other types of uses or development within the federal lands. And, for example, how does that work and how do you get decisions on that that satisfy both parties and what's the mechanism around that? So we had a, a fair number of questions around the management and governance side. Who's the uh, client for the plan? Do you have one man that uh, signs off on it and, and once it's signed off on it, how do they change it? Is there a council? How's it done? The, uh, the Urban Planning Council is the authority that approves uh, the plan and any changes to the plan as well as any of the implementation strategies that come from that. And that is uh, chaired by uh, the, the, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Thank you. Um, we've talked about a, a global kind of a city and we've talked about uh, technology. But I'm curious to what extent you're looking at uh, your traditional forms. You mentioned the walled city concept as a way of, of uh, enforcing compactness. But I'm, and you mentioned the narrow streets uh, for shade, which I highly applaud. But I'm wondering if you're also looking, for example, at uh, you know, courtyard forms, uh, the, the, the compact courtyard form versus the freestanding villa and apartment block and other traditional ways of dealing, uh, which I think are very energy efficient with, with heat. Yeah, one example of this uh, particular uh, uh, landscaping issue is that we had a lot of green spaces in Abu Dhabi that were unused for six to seven months a year, big spaces. So we opted to go uh, with green fingers uh, through, throughout the, the, the city so we can uh, import cold, uh, cool breezes. And we had small courtyard or green courtyards within, all over the city. The total green area in the city is higher than what is in Abu Dhabi, but it's a completely different, differently distributed than what you see in other, I mean, in, in places like the US, you can find big uh, green spaces that are usable around the year. In Abu Dhabi, these areas become deserted for six months, so it's a green desert. That's why we, we changed the whole concept of green spaces in the city. And there's a lot of other examples in the planning that we adopted also of the hot weather. Here's a question um, about global warming. What, how have you in Abu Dhabi addressed the question of global warming and rise, potentially rising sea levels in an archipelago? How are you dealing with that if the seas are indeed rising? How does this affect a city that is built on the sea? How does the 2030 plan deal it, with it's, it's a question that's been raised in the 2030 plan, and it's one of the, uh, the, the challenges and activities that's ahead of us in implementing it, is we've got to think about that, and what does that mean for the design of the city, um, particularly the, the new waterfront communities that are being developed. Mm -hmm. uh, things are happening fast there, so um, we do need to be uh, coming up with some uh, a strategy around that in, in the short mm -hmm. term, and that's something we're, we're paying attention to now. Okay. Scott, is that, you think that's it? I think it? perhaps we have time for some final thoughts um, that we're here in Washington, D.C. Um, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with both us? And then this will be going up on the web as well, so a larger audience. Well, I, I'll start by saying that there is a lot of skepticism for what Mustard City is, is going to be and how successful it's going to be. And we welcome the, these scientific challenges because we can only learn and adjust from them. And for the believers in the model like this, we are having an open invitation to collaborate in the city because we think we don't have the solution on our own. This is only an idea and a vision and uh, an initial planning, but we need all the knowledge that's available in the world to be able to come and participate to build the city. And I would just say that similarly that as we're doing it, the plan 2030, that the and implementing it, that it's the sharing of ideas on that global scale now, where we can look at best practices and think of the different tools available, the things maybe that may be appropriate at a certain time in Abu Dhabi, well maybe won't be later, and we can look to other cities for best practices and, and vice versa. So really start that, uh, continue that sharing. Yeah, and uh, it occurs to me that Mostar is now vying with the city in China 
to be the first uh, carbon zero city. And I have to ask why, why there? Why not here? <laughs> why don't we have a hundred Mostars, a thousand Mostars? Why shouldn't every single new suburb be a Mostar? Uh, that's, I think, our challenge right now. And uh, for myself, I would say that, um, that you raised the very question that really struck me, and that is that in a lifetime of following the development of uh, design and the implementation of design around the really around the globe, we've seen an explosion, a real explosion uh, of construction and hopes and aspirations in urban places in the last decade. Really unprecedented, I think, in human history. In the case of China, the largest migration in the history of the world. Uh, in the case of uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, astounding. Uh, challenging and amazing dreaming and execution, something that I think most of us never could have hoped for. What I'm encouraged by with this particular example in Abu Dhabi is the fact that they have uh, chosen sustainability and uh, careful planning, even if just for one component, a place of 50,000 people, to serve as a model for the rest of the world, because the world is building and building like crazy. And the question is, are they building well? And in many cases, and in fact in most, I think they're not. They're not being thoughtful enough. They're not planning carefully enough. Uh, there's not enough investment in the public realm. And uh, here, this is, uh, I think, uh, hope for cultures around the world as a lesson. Now. The implementation, I can tell you, we will be <laughs> scrutinizing what you do. Yeah. You have held up this model, and we're going to be intensely interested to see that you execute it uh, with uh, the finesse and the uh, thoroughness that it promises. But if it is able to do that, uh, you will have done a great thing. So I want to thank the panel. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you.